Hey everybody, welcome to Sweater Weather, a podcast about Canadian arts and culture. I'm Aaron Giovanone, a writer and a professor. And I'm Naomi Lewis, otherwise known as Naomi K. Lewis, a writer and editor. Oh, you threw the K in today. Yeah, I don't know. A little <laughs> something different. What, is the K, what does the K stand for? It stands for cockamamie. <laughs> uh, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying Montreal quite a bit. Me too. People have been known to like this city. They have been. Yeah. They like it a lot and we like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we like the cheese. We like the bread. We like the walks. We like the talks. We like the wines. We like the people. We like the parks. We like the stores. We like... How do you like the Le Francais? Um, a little harder to deal it's with. It's a little harder, even though I allegedly learned French as a child. <laughs> I, and I understand when people speak mostly, which is quite nice, but yeah. then I be, I'm rendered mute when it is my time <laughs> to speak. <laughs> I, uh, I like the challenge. It forces me to, to use my French. And, yeah. yeah. You like a challenge. I don't like a challenge. I prefer things to just be easy breezy. <laughs> the subject of our show today is a fun one, I think. We're talking about The Rehearsal, a six-part comedy on HBO, created by, starring, directed by... Canadian comedian Nathan Fielder. Nathan Fielder. Now, what kind of show is the rehearsal, just in case people out there haven't seen it? Well, I'd call it a comedy reality show. So the star, Nathan Fielder, he's interacting with real people, uh, non-actors, right? Mm -hmm. In order to get them to do funny, revealing, embarrassing, sometimes profound things on camera. So it's kind of like Sasha Baron Cohen's various projects like Borat and probably a more distant cousin of prank shows mm -hmm. like Punked with Ashton Kutcher or Johnny Knoxville's Jackass series and of course the originator really of all of these shows at least in the modern era is probably Tom Green yeah future episode of Sweater Weather yeah I think he is kind of the originator so although Nathan Fielder is doing something and each of those people are doing something very different from the others mm -hmm. but it is all of a kind in a way yeah Nathan Fielder is kind of like uh, doing reality TV like you said comedy reality TV TV but it's also like meta reality meta reality meta TV. reality TV very much a, a, a kind of parody of reality TV in some ways yeah, but I, yeah, I think even more than a parody, like he builds these layers where you become completely uh, uh, baffled about what's real and what isn't. Maybe none of it's real. Maybe parts of it are and parts of it are not. And mm -hmm. and although like we already know that reality TV is largely staged and sometimes the hand of the producers is weighs very heavily on what you see in reality. Yeah, I mean TV. not just through editing, but through actually telling the people to do certain things because. Yeah. It's more compelling for the audience and people play up their persona because if yeah. they do that, if people act silly and crazy, like they have a better chance of being on camera and making it to the final cut and stuff like that. So, yeah. And so the rehearsal really plays on all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're left questioning not just what's real and what isn't on TV, but like kind of what's real and what isn't in real life. And then also he like when you're watching reality TV or, you know, Tom Green or those other shows, none of which I've seen, but I can imagine. Um, you find yourself asking, is this is this right? Is this ethical? Is this fair? And this show kind of goes meta on that as well. That's right. That's I mean, a... not kind of, it absolutely does. Yeah, so the concept is this, and this is the source of the name of the show, the rehearsal. Participants volunteer to participate in the show because they want to solve a problem mm -hmm. in their real lives. So Nathan Fielder proposes to them that they will rehearse the, the, these scenarios before they have to actually do it in real life. So Fielder, he mentions that this rehearsal technique is something that he learned mm -hmm. while working on his other, his previous reality show, reality comedy show called Nathan For You, which we'll get into a little bit later. You know, where he would try to get people to do certain things and he'd have to rehearse the sorts of things that he would say to them oh. or do around them to try to provoke certain kinds of responses. He mm. doesn't go into that much detail describing it in the show, yeah. in the rehearsal, but he does mention at the beginning that this is something he's had to learn to do in his work. Right. 
He says in the opening narration to the rehearsal in the first episode of the show, quote, I wanted to show that if you plan for every variable, a happy outcome doesn't have to be left to chance. Mm -hmm. So that's the concept of the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. So much of the show is feel they're going to absurd lengths to stage these rehearsals in incredible detail. And Fielder gets himself kind of drawn into the participants' lives uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. He becomes kind of the one who we're um, watching. He becomes the guinea pig of the show or the kind of butt of the joke as well as the um, like the yeah the specimen that's being studied in the science experiment as the show goes on. That's right. I think people who want to defend the show on ethical grounds and say he's not just making fun of people. He, I mean, sometimes people seem silly. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a comedy show, so he's trying to make people laugh, make people mm -hmm. in the audience laugh. But he, the joke is also often on him, and that's true in this show too. Like he's off, he's drawn into the experiments himself. He's the one often being laughed at or making fun of himself. And you can tell he sets himself up to be for these jokes, like very clearly. Rewatching the show, I noticed many times that he was doing that. Yeah. yeah. Although, I mean, the other people are not in control. He's staging the whole thing. He has control over the editing. Yeah. He's creating a persona that he's playing in this show. And he's totally in control of that persona Indeed. and how it comes across. And it kind of reminds me in a way, I mean, when we first watched the first episode of this together, I'd never seen Nathan for you. I think you'd seen a bit of it. But I was really taken aback and, and disturbed by the first episode of the show. And I felt like it was mean and it was... I, I did feel like I didn't really understand. And now, I mean, of course, you realize that you're not supposed to understand. You're supposed to be confused at first. But like, is this whole thing actors? Is this whole thing real? How much of this is really happening? Like, is he serious when he says that he built a replica of this guy's apartment and then re yeah. like pre-enacted mm -hmm. their meeting so that he would be ready for any contingency in their conversation? Yeah. Um, and you never, of course, you never know how much of that is real and how much of it is staged. But I mean, it's funny when I think back now that I was so disturbed by it because I am a writer of nonfiction and I've written a memoir and that's not so different, right? In certain ways. And I know like... It's not really, no. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely have had people... I have a close friend who feels that, um, believes that writing the kind of memoir I wrote is unethical, which is kind of like writing any memoir, really, um, in that I exposed people in ways that they hadn't agreed to, and partic in particular people close to me. But really, it could be anybody, right? I mean, the point being that these other people don't have control over how they're being presented at all. They don't. And yeah. I have complete control over the narrative. I yeah. mean, to the extent that I... I'm aware of what I'm doing and I'm in control of the craft, right? But I'm able to present. So even though I say about my memoir, I can say, well, I don't make myself look that great either. Like, mm -hmm. I don't make myself look better than the other people in the book. Mm -hmm. Everyone just comes across as human and um, flawed and lovable in all the ways that humans are flawed and lovable. And I can also say, but I explicitly say that this is my thing, my project and it's through my, the lens of my subjectivity. But at the same time, um, it's also true that I am in control of it and those people aren't. And the persona that I chose to portray in that book, like it's not 100% me or 100% of me. And it is a flawed character that I present and like a character that you can laugh with and at but it's also a character that I chose to portray exactly the way that it's portrayed yeah. and the other people that I portray in that book did not have any control over that even if I'm quoting them directly describing exactly what happened like I'm choosing what to put in what not to put in I'm choosing yeah. the context I'm choosing the tone yeah and um so it's quite hypocritical of me to criticize um, and also because I do often lean into humor in my writing in a way that could be um, that I could be accused of making the reader laugh at the characters. And so I just find it funny that when I reflect back on myself that I'm so disturbed by Nathan Fielder doing this when it's exactly the kind of thing really that I would do. Well, I mean, there are different things that come into play when it's a different medium. And when yes. someone's being shown on camera, too. Sure. And you change people's names often or whatever. I mean, that's just something. Yeah. 
that you do out of out of consideration. So there are big differences. There are big too. differences. And also Nathan Fielder's audience is much bigger. That's <laughs> so right. these people become like instant celebrities and they haven't chosen exactly how they're being portrayed, presumably. Right. I'm, and also some of them are children, which is another topic that we can talk about. Um, so my, my like I came into the show not so dismayed by the first, like shocked by it because I've seen Nathan's, Nathan Fielder's work before. So... He uh, had a show some years ago from 2013 to 2017. It was on Comedy Central. It was called Nathan For You. I liked that show a lot. I watched the first season or two. Now, after that, I did stop watching, partly because just I had moved and I didn't have access to Comedy Central for a while. Um, but I, I also didn't seek it out again afterwards. And I, I stopped watching partly because I felt bad at times watching it. Mm. Now, Nathan For You was a parody of a reality show. It parodied the kind of reality show where the production goes to save a failing business. Mm -hmm. So a lot like Gordon Ramsay's uh, Kitchen Nightmares. Oh, yeah. And Nathan, for you, you know, Fielder would ask a small business, essentially, if they wanted to participate in a TV show that would help them promote their business. And, you know, lots of businesses are going to say yes to mm -hmm. that, right? Especially a struggling business. They're going to agree to free publicity on the show. So, of course, you, as you can imagine, he gets them to do silly things. So, for example, this is, I think, the first episode of the series. He managed to convince the owner of an ice cream shop to offer a poo-flavored ice cream. <laughs> See, now, <laughs> now, that one is like, well, maybe that's not a great idea for your ice cream shop. Uh, Why? Like, what's the idea behind this? I was just to get the... publicity. Oh, okay, no, okay. no press is bad press. I mean, that is behind all of these schemes. That is ultimately what you land on as a justification. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there was an episode. And did it work? He did it. And they, did they get business? I don't recall. Okay, okay. Now, something that did work, though, uh, an episode about a petting zoo that was trying to promote itself. So this one's kind of cute. Fielders faked a social media video where a baby pig from the petting zoo jumped into the water to save a drowning baby goat. <laughs> a baby goat? <laughs> and this was like, it was elaborately staged by, with like, they show, of course, the making of the video, and it was elaborately staged with like scuba divers under oh, the water, wow. like carrying, like carrying the uh, pig and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's really really funny and that one did work that video went viral and okay. it was and it was um it was on the news as well wow okay he uh he got a struggling diner owner to stage uh to stage uh an event again for the news that would attract attention to the the diner so their idea was that a celebrity impersonator was going to leave a ten thousand dollar tip and that could be a story that the news would pick up so okay. it goes into with this stunt, as with all the others, what you, a big appeal of Nathan for you, and this is amped up a hundred times maybe in the rehearsal, is the absurd complexity of the plans yes. to get this thing, this plan to happen. Right, right. So, for example, with this diner owner, they were like, okay, well, we need a celebrity impersonator to come into the diner. And so he is, there's of course funny scenes where he's interviewing celebrity impersonators and there's like a very bad Jim Carrey impersonator. <laughs> and there's a very bad Kramer impersonator. Oh, really? Yeah, and so the diner <laughs> owner chooses the Kramer impersonator. <laughs> this is after the whole, the whole problem with Michael Richards, the controversy of him using the N-word in, right. in a comedy sk skit or whatever. So anyway, he's like, well, you know, there's been some controversy about Michael Richards and the go diner owner's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like an old guy. He's kind of out of touch. Yeah. He? And then they, but then they need to get. So this is an example of some of how of how complex it gets. They have to go. F he thinks that he needs to go find somebody named Michael Richards so he can borrow his credit card to use it <laughs> for the receipt because right. on the on the news there's always a picture of the receipt. Okay. And right, he said right. he, he so he decided the receipt needed to be legitimate. Yeah. And have a real Michael Richards pay for okay. it. Okay. And so he goes to try to find a Michael Richards who will let them use his credit this card. Very Nathan. It Fielder. will not work. So he has to go. And find someone who's willing to change their name to Michael Richards and then get a credit card. <laughs> and of course, who's willing to do that? Like some very sketchy kind of like guy with a, crim with a criminal history. Okay. okay. <laughs> and there's this funny exchange where like Nathan feels like, you're not going to run away with the money that we're putting in the account, are you? And he's like, no, 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 I won't. 
<laughs> so he handcuffs himself to this man for the entire day so that he can't so that he can't run away oh my gosh so does he get to change his name back i'm worried about this guy <laughs> yeah i know i know uh, they don't show that they right, don't show that right. so um that that worked by the way too they got a, a spot on the news mm -hmm. because of the the ten thousand dollar tip that michael richards left um there was uh, that actually nathan few first came into i think popular it kind of burst out of its bubble as being like a kind of a niche comedy show that mm -hmm. comedy nerds liked in its second season when he did an episode called dumb starbucks okay. and so it begins with nathan fielder trying to get a cafe owner to, to it's a struggling cafe and he says you know you don't really have a strong brand for your cafe so the best brand in the game is starbucks what we're going to do is you're going to change you're going to use the starbucks branding and you're going to protect yourself using parody law so you're going to pretend like this is all just a joke okay the idea is everything is going to be dumb Starbucks. They're going to call the show, they call the cafe dumb Starbucks and everything's <laughs> going to be like dumb venti latte or something. <laughs> and so the cafe owner, he goes along for a while and then he jumps ship. But, but Nathan, Nathan goes ahead with the idea and opens his own cafe okay. called dumb Starbucks. Yeah. And it actually works and it uh, becomes a viral sensation and it is actually, it does make international headlines. Oh, wow. And there are lineups around the corner to go to dumb Starbucks. And they had to shut it down because eventually because Starbucks was going to sue them. <laughs> Which is what the original cafe owner was worried about. Right. Anyway, these are all very good and they were very, like a lot of these actually worked as publicity stunts and they're very funny. Like at times though, like I do think this show, Nathan For You, it strayed into being rather mean. Like sometimes he would be, because he's just trying to get people to to react and do something yeah. funny his typical behavior is interesting it's like completely deadpan yeah extremely low energy non-threatening kind of nerdy awkward vibe yeah and that really works because it brings people out of their shells and he's often finding very strange if not outrageous personality types who f feel comfortable around him to just sort of say and do things that are Pretty, can be pretty weird or very entertaining but uh sometimes he was he would in this show he would sometimes try like depending on what kind of a person he was dealing with he would be mean mm -hmm. he would sometimes be mean so i remember one time one episode it was about a horse it was a, a horse ranch it was a rancher what he did for her was he knew that like so large people could not ride horses if you're over 220 pounds you can't ride a horse okay generally because it may hurt the horse so what he did is he figured out a way that if he attached these huge weather balloons to people it would lighten their their loads so that a larger person could go on a okay. horse ride so he did this okay, okay with a volunteer and at the end he says to the ranch owner well aren't you like this is the first time that a, you know a plus size person has really ever ridden a horse safely like this is you're going to enter the history books for this and she said well i hope i'm not known for this he's <laughs> <laughs> like i hope i'm known for my horses or maybe my dogs or for being a nice person and he said he said like he said no offense but you won't be known for any of those things you'll be known for this and only this <laughs> Anyway, that I mean that was like an example of him being rude or whatever, but like actually in many cases like sometimes you feel like he's dealing with desperate people or maybe mentally ill people. Yeah. Although he's never frames it like that, you kind of get the sense that he he may be doing that and yeah. and depending on how he treats them, it works or it doesn't. Like it can you can do it, but it all depends I think artistically on your tone. And so sometimes he would just, the tone would turn into just be mean. It would be too mean, it would be too mocking. This is also a show from 10 years ago, you know, almost mm -hmm, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So comedy was different then. But like, this is one that is like an extremely problematic episode. So there is an episode where Nathan and his father, his real life father, they liked to wear a certain jacket. Okay. It, was, it was a soft shell hiking jacket from a Vancouver based outdoor clothing store called Taiga and it was uh, actually founded by like, a German immigrant so but strangely this company um, was uh, embroiled in a um, controversy when they published a like a spring catalog that for some reason featured a famous Holocaust denier in okay it. yeah 
So then Nathan and his dad, who are Jewish, they, they could not wear the jacket anymore. And so this is presented on the show as a problem because they really like the jacket, but they're not allowed to wear it anymore. Mm. So Nathan starts his own clothing company. He calls it Summit Ice, and he designed a nice looking jacket. And he, and he said all proceeds would go to Holocaust education. And actually this became a real business and he sold a bunch and he made, apparently made like a half a million dollars or something selling these jackets. But then to promote his jacket, he makes it into another segment on his show. He collaborates with a rabbi, a very strange rabbi, I would say, who suggests that to promote this jacket, that he set up a display in a clothing store that features swastikas, pictures of dead bodies, and even has a model of an oven with bones in it. What? To show as part of Holocaust education. Oh. So... The clothing store owner was extremely mad when he saw this and um, you know that seemed like like kind of in poor taste um, it seemed kind of exploitative but I mean but wait a minute exploitative of well, this weird rabbi or of like people yeah, who died I don't in the know. I mean certainly just okay let's just say that okay it seems to me in many ways that goes too far yeah it, it wasn't funny it was just very uncomfortable. It doesn't sound funny at all. But it was very uncomfortable, and this is another emotion that many of his stunts could provoke. Yeah. And um, for me, it also seemed mean to his participants because he's actually putting their stores like at risk. Yeah, in that's a way. Right. So, you know, to me, uh, yeah, sometimes the tone would not work. And also, as a formula, as a concept, it be- it was kind of limited. Like. It, I would get fatigued watching the show. I would f- start to find um, it kind of boring. Mm. The individual gags would be very funny. He's very funny. But as a formula, it, it's impossible to have a through line in a show like this because mm-hmm. it's just segment to segment. You're always moving on to a new business and new participants. So you don't ever get character development. You don't get a long story arc. And so it ends up being something that's hard to watch Mm -hmm. after a certain amount of time and that was just me because the show over its four seasons on comedy central it grew every year in viewership uh sometimes it would be number one in its uh for young men the young men demographic in its time slot so it was a hit comedy central wanted it wanted nathan fielder to do more of it but he actually decided to stop um and so what we see a few years later now with his new show, The Rehearsal, is um, him going back to some of the things from Nathan For You mm-hmm. that um, like many of these tricks and techniques that he developed, but also trying to find uh, a longer form, right? To develop a story arc, yes. to get more into various characters who are people who appear on the show yeah a story arc that goes through the whole season not just one episode that's right Mm -hmm. yeah and also using himself i think even more as one of these characters that may be able to provide a through line through the show where you see nathan's developing consciousness or you know emotional development right right so so nathan fielder is canadian He was uh, born in Vancouver in 1983. Both his parents are social workers. He was educated at a private Jewish elementary school. Then he went to a public high high school. Uh, At 13, he got into magic. He joined the Vancouver Magic Circle. He worked at a magic shop at the mall. And he performed at kids' birthday parties. Oh, that is so apt. And you see him every now and then pull out a magic trick in the show as well. Mm -hmm. Like he'll just do it. He'll just do it for fun. The whole show is a magic trick, though. It's all <laughs> sleight of hand. It's all yeah. making you look one way and something else happening somewhere else. And mm. you don't know what's real. You don't know what's not. You suspect that nothing is, but the illusion is perfect. So, yeah, it's it's kind of perfect that he was into magic. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think when you're watching a magician, you are amazed by the performance mm-hmm. right and so the rehearsal is really something that brings attention to the performance absolutely like the, the the all of the machinations to put together the show and nathan constantly thinking up into a new angle and a new trick mm-hmm. and so that's part of the pleasure of watching the rehearsal absolutely. is seeing the performance yeah on that level 
Um, he was acquaintances with Seth Rogen, right? Also from Vancouver, oh, okay. and actually he was in a high school improv group with, oh, okay. with Seth Rogen. They're just they're just one year apart in age. He did a degree in business at the University of Victoria, and this is a fact that he plays up in the opening sequence of Nathan for you. Uh, he says, "I attended one of Canada's best business schools," and they flash a picture of the yeah flag. <laughs> his transcript, and and, they, and and got really good grades, and they show his grades, and it's like <laughs> B plus. C minus. <laughs> I think there was an A in there. There was an A minus in there. <laughs> okay. But it was like definitely a B average yeah. at, at most. Yeah. So he, he worked in brokerage for a while, but then he just moved to Toronto to give comedy a shot. And so he did the Humber comedy program and he performed stand up around town. And he, he had a lot of success like pretty early. So he got a job writing for Canadian Idol. And then he oh. got then he got another job on This Hour Has 22 Minutes in the 2008 2009 season he wrote for the show and he was also a correspondent who would appear on his in his own segment it was called nathan on your side very close to nathan for you where he parodied consumer interest stories so he was like a consumer interest reporter and his interview style deadpan uncomfortable getting people playing tricks on people getting them to do weird stuff this was already like fully formed this hour has 22 minutes, is filmed in Halifax, and we don't know much about his personal life, really. He doesn't really talk about his personal life at all, but he was married to the Halifax librarian hmm. from 2011 to 2014. In 2011, he moved to Hollywood. He got a gig working on the Comedy Central show Important Things with Dimitri Martin. That's a show I remember watching and liking. Uh, and then then uh, soon after, John Benjamin has a, ba- a van, which was another Comedy Central show. And then in 2013, he launched his own show, Nathan For You, the one I've been talking about, Mm -hmm. which is a parody of business rescue reality shows. Now, it ran for four seasons, 31 episodes. In 2020, then that was, so it ended in, so Nathan For You ended in 2017. He took a few years off. He seemed to be trying out different stuff. In 2020, he became executive producer for a very interesting HBO show. It's a documentary comedy called How To with John Wilson. And it's based entirely on this comedian, John Wilson's personal video footage. He walks around, it's first person video, so you don't see him. Oh, okay. You just see where he's walking and pointing his camera. He goes around New York and all of the whole show really comes together through editing. And the footage is edited into these funny, sort of sad, philosophical, personal video essays. Hmm. Uh, it's very artsy mm-hmm. and it's very prestige t- TV and it's very low budget too so there wasn't a lot to be lost I think doing the show for right. HBO and it's had a few it's had a couple of seasons now and I've watched it and it's quite nice it seemed like that was a way for Nathan Fielder as the producer of that show to get in with HBO so now on July 15th of this year he launched the rehearsal so wait Nathan for you is not HBO it was no, this is a point I want to make here. Yeah, like, so this is a big, this is one of the major differences between Nathan For You on Comedy Central and right. the rehearsal now is that what he's done is he has moved to prestige television. He's moved from uh, more, I would say, kind of lowbrow at times, populist um, network show Mm -hmm. on comedy central to a prestige show which makes different claims right and and it has audience that expects somewhat different things so i think this is one of the rehearsals innovations is he did bring reality tv to a prestige network and he managed to do that really well watching reality tv you know what do you expect i'm not a huge reality tv viewer but like I think you're often in there for the the spectacle, for pure entertainment. You like you know hot bodies, a totally manufactured emotional situations, yeah. exotic locales. It really yeah. is just spectacle. Often. And people behaving like badly. Badly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now the prestige viewer, however, they expect to be improved by their viewing experience. They want art. They want to learn something mm-hmm. when watching a show. And so the rehearsal does both it really does so he manages to put in just straight up jokes there's tons of laughs uh it's often very subtle it's often done just through a voiceover a Mm -hmm. voiceover over incongruous footage right so like maybe just showing 
pictures of the very boring looking pictures of the town in Oregon where they're filming and it's just like a roadside stand and just like a kind of a dilapidated barn and he's like we're here it's like we're here in beautiful Oregon <laughs> it's just like <laughs> that is a laugh it is he does little things like that uh, but as well as like really big like just sight gags like so much of yes. the show is based on seeing people dressed up like as other people because they're, yes. con- they're constantly rehearsing so yes. there's always this like very funny sight gags of showing the real person and then showing the person playing that person yes. and so that always gets a lot of laughs so it's like it's really working just on a basic comedy level but it also claims to be showing or revealing something interesting or new or profound about people or even about Fielder himself it, it kind of claims in a way to be a social experiment yes. so that we're going to learn something about human nature watching this and so that's where the prestige uh, appeal I think like what he's doing in the rehearsal is something more profound than Nathan for you and, mm-hmm. and also more insidious because in Nathan for you he's intervening in people's business mm-hmm. lives in the rehearsal he's intervening in their personal lives yeah. and it's that move from business to person like something personal that is really where the um, stakes go up the stakes go up and it becomes more it has to become more artful so the tone has shifted you know where nathan for you would often be mocking i don't really find this show mocking i really don't um it's subtler it's softer there is critique of the people he does like get laughs uh, like at their expense Mm -hmm. but it is much softer it's more refined so um maybe you could just tell us about the rehearsal how it's structured and it's different episodes okay so there's six episodes of the rehearsal yeah nathan fielder at the beginning of episode one meets with a real real man called core who is a teacher and a a bar trivia enthusiast. And bar trivia is this guy's hobby. He has a problem in his personal life that he wants help solving. Um, And Nathan's found him on Craigslist after advertising for people who want help with some problem with their personal life. And the guy, um, his issue is that he has been on the same trivia team for years and years and he told them Um, that he had a master's degree when in fact he only has a bachelor's degree he feels really really guilty about it and he wants to come clean but he's not sure how to do it without alien without alienating himself from his trivia team which is his main social um his main social network so nathan tells the guy that he has created a replica of his apartment without his knowledge and that he's been rehearsing with an actor playing this guy to like get this one interaction just right as they first meet so that's how we're introduced first to the whole notion of rehearsing you're right they cut to an actor who like looks just like core yeah very (laughs) similar and he's acting just like him he's like like taken on his personality and his way of speaking and nathan's going through all these different ways that he could introduce the concept to core and like how core might react with the help of this actor and then he tells core this the whole point of this is we're going to rehearse your interaction with your friend from the trivia team trisha until we get it just right and then there's nothing that can possibly go wrong the point of this is you'll have every possible contingency Um, planned so whatever she says you'll have rehearsed it and you'll know what to say next Mm -hmm. and there's no way to fail so then we learn that he's created a replica of the bar where where uh core plays trivia as a set and this is a huge wow moment for the audience yeah when we see inside this replica of the bar yeah it's exactly like the real bar but it's in this giant warehouse space where he built his replicas and he has an actor playing Trisha, the friend. Oh, and he gets, like, he, he goes to these great lengths, like we talked about, to have these things unfold the way he wants. So he manipulates the real Trisha into meeting up with the actor under false circumstances so the actor can learn Trisha's manner. <laughs> and then um, the actor shows up and has, like, gotten it down. Like, she can talk just like Trisha. And then they go through, like, rehearsal after rehearsal of how this interaction might go where Cora is going to reveal his secret and then ultimately like I can't spend too much time discussing everything that happens in the show but they skip to skip ahead he does the real interaction it does not go exactly as planned 
but it has a great outcome. He tells Trisha the truth. Trisha takes it really well, and their their friendship becomes um, strengthened by it. Um, and we learn that their friendship has been even more strengthened by it as time went on after that. So you found this exploitative. You mentioned that when you first watched it, you felt uncomfortable with it. Now, what is it about the show that makes you feel like that episode, the way you described it? What What's like? What did you, didn't you like about it? What made you feel uncomfortable? About well, it? I felt like the humor in it was all laughing at the characters. So Cor and Trisha's eccentricities are kind of brought to the fore by having actors play them, um, and by kind of like having them rehearse over and over. We we see their quirks brought into sharp relief, and I feel like a lot of the humor was like the laughs were coming from that in a not too kind way and same with like the, even just the fact that Cora was so invested in the bar trivia not just in his relationships with the rest of the team but in winning the bar trivia because that's like a kind of subplot is that he's not willing to forfeit his chances of winning bar trivia in order to have this intense <laughs> conversation <laughs> he has to, that's another subplot so he has to figure out a way to let Cora to get Cora to win this bar trivia yeah because uh, core f- that would be very bad for his self esteem in this like yeah. in this like important moment. Yeah. If he lost our yeah. trivia, that so night. he's like Nathan surreptitiously has like Nathan learn the answers <laughs> to all the questions in advance without knowing that he's doing it, and it's it's so absurd. It's and very, uh, I mean I just found this so surprising. Yeah, it is like, surprising. Like at every turn, I was surprised by what. Nathan was up to next what his mm-hmm. plan what his plans were now and so there's a real for that for me there's a real delight in that constant surprise mm-hmm. I mean I have to say that the, the surprises the machinations that's what I really I really enjoyed that mm-hmm. in, in the show one of the things you're doing when you're watching the show is watching people who have chosen to be on a reality TV yeah. show to discuss their personal problems so does it feel like these people um, are not fully in control of their lives, maybe? Or does it feel like they're searching in the wrong place for some help? Mm-hmm. Or are they really, would they just really like to be on TV and they're actually fine with what they're doing on TV? Like they themselves don't have a problem mm-hmm. with it. If that's the case, I, 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 I often wonder like, well, who am I to say that they shouldn't be doing this? Sure. That's often how I feel about it. Yeah, I know what you mean, and I and I I think I agree with that in retrospect. I just know watching it, I felt like too much of I felt uncomfortable, and maybe this was just me. Maybe I am the jerk here, but I felt uncomfortable seeing the great lengths that these that Nathan and Cor were willing to go to in order to have this um, conversation about something that was like being treated as incredibly consequential when like it shouldn't really have been that consequential i felt like um the, i think a lot of the humor comes from that incongruity between the problem which is small and the great lengths that you go to to right. to confront it right that's one of the major i mean i think this makes the premise so funny really when it comes to the like the people who are on the show, I mean, I have to say these are the kind of, these are people who you would never otherwise see represented on TV, quite frankly. Yeah. And at times you may be laughing at their eccentricities or quirks or frailties, but other times you really identify with them and like seeing him so anxious. Um, Core. Seeing Core so anxious yeah. about something that seems like not a big deal, but he's very status conscious. Yes. And that's something that a lot of people identify yes, with. Yes, that's that, true. That, that's I could, true. Uh, that I could understand, understand that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I wouldn't ever trust my representation yeah. to a reality show. Well, that's the thing, is that I think what made me uncomfortable at, co- at the core of Core was that he seems, he was so vulnerable and he'd put himself in such a vulnerable position and at that point, like, I really didn't trust Nathan with other people's vulnerabilities, right? I just yeah. felt like, what is he doing? He's just trying to get, like, this person's being so open, so willing to do whatever crazy stuff Nathan suggests. And he's so earnestly committed to, you know, improving his relationship with his friends and to also winning the bar trivia. And he's just so, yeah, like, his heart was on his sleeve. Yeah, And I was just like, I don't feel comfortable with someone's heart being on their sleeve and Nathan Fielder being the person mm-hmm. who has that heart and can do what they will with it. The, the, and that it's on TV. Right. And so the question is, well, he has this power, 
does he use it inappropriately? Yeah. I don't feel like I can't really think very often of times where I thought he did. He makes a few little jokes about him Mm -hmm. along the way, but none of them seem too mean spirited. Mm -hmm. They seemed um, tonally like they seem fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's the other thing when people are strange or weird or frail, like, I mean, it is just being honest, partly to show them, <laughs> to show them. Yeah. Like that is one thing that reality TV or documentary claims to do is like, well, show reality as it is. I found that kind of refreshing again to see someone like this on TV acting so anxious, being, yeah, insecure or vulnerable. And if I had to, I, I would find myself more or less defending uh, the rehearsal. Everything is under Nathan's power. He's in control. He's allowed to do everything with people who seem like vulnerable. Mm-hmm. How does he use his power? And I don't feel like he abuses it. No, and I agree with that. As the show went on, I felt like, oh, okay. Like I was, and maybe intentionally led to think this was one kind of show and it's actually another kind of show. Mm-hmm. Um, in the second episode, he starts a new Should rehearsal. Me- right, and that takes up the rest of the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah it continues to the rest of the series. It's a five episode arc, I guess. Where he, um, he meets a 40 year old woman, Angela, who is thinking about having a child, but isn't sure if parenthood is for her. So he sets Angela up in what she has described as her dream house, mm-hmm. where she wants to, you know, her life to be a certain way. She wants a big house. She wants a garden. She wants to spend her time gardening. She and... wants to live in Oregon. She wants to live in the countryside in Oregon. Yeah. So they actually go and do this all in the countryside in Oregon. And they set up this this giant set, right, with a garden and with the house. And it's a real, and, it's a real um, house. Sure, but I mean, they make time seem to pass by like having fake snow, and it's supposed to be winter, and and. Um, <laughs> She gets to raise a kid, a kid. She's rehearsing Adam. being a parent. Yeah, so let me describe it. So she gets to rehearse raising this boy called Adam, who will grow, I think it's three years every day. And so the child actors are constantly switched out. So it's like every few hours, there's a new Adam. Or, and or every, I think it's three years it's every like a, week. It's three years a week. Is that right? Three years, three a, years week. a week. So, so you have Adam a week, will, a week yeah. with yeah. So um, a few days with each actor. Yeah. But because under a certain age, child actors can't work more than a certain number of hours. Four hours. The ki- the babies have to be switched out every four hours. So when her back is turned, you see someone like reach in, take the baby and put in another baby. So there's like a real... <laughs> <laughs> Again, more funny. This yeah, is really that is funny. really funny. And you also get to see the parents of the child actors kind of back you know mm-hmm. behind the scenes watching and making sure everything's okay mm-hmm. so it's kind of on both levels you're seeing the experience of the rehearsal and then you're also seeing the setup of the rehearsal each time and um as this so that's episode two is the setup for that then as the series continues um nathan as he's continuing with angela tries to find her a partner a male partner because she's like i would rather you know, in real life, have a male partner. So he tries to find a man to rehearse the other partner in the situation. He finds a very, like, eccentric guy, and it does not work out, although at first they seem to connect over their their Christian beliefs. Right. Right. So there's something, like, the way the show mixes, just in its very fabric, is constantly weaving falsity with reality. mm -hmm often you know you're often on the audience is being tricked too and it's revealed to you later that this was actually instead of being a real interaction this was actually an actor that nathan set set up set yeah. up to do something i was ex- so this is a good example where this this guy who's like really cool dude really good looking like chill he's a very weird guy in yeah. a lot of ways too as you'll say in a minute I was convinced that at any moment Nathan, that he was an actor. nathan would reveal that he was an actor right but he wasn't but he, he was wasn't real. and so again there's yeah. this that kind of tension is often present in the show. And you don't is, know. And, and, that's, yeah. it, and it's interesting. It does keep you engaged. Yeah, in that's ways. right. Yeah. And he wanted Angela and the guy to connect in real life, like to at least like each other enough that they could imagine, pretend that they're a married couple, right? Like he didn't want it to just be, a, he didn't want it to just be an actor. He wanted it to be someone real who was yeah. also rehearsing. Yeah. But that doesn't, the guy flees during his first night because he has to wake up so much to, Every time the baby cries, he has to wake up, and then eventually he gets too tired and he just leaves. They made a point of wanting to chase him away. I think, yeah, they made the baby cry like, like every ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's a robot baby. At night, at of course, point. a real ba- yeah. At night, of course, yeah. a real baby actor could not be there, yeah. so they 
<laughs> they had a robot baby. A robot baby, and they can and program it to do stuff. To cry whenever they want. So it's crying all the time, and the guy eventually is just like, I can't take this. And he runs away. So Nathan decides that he will step in and be the father in the rehearsal. Right. He asks uh, consent. Yeah. He's very clear. He's like, is it okay if we do this? Or? Yes, and Angela agrees to it. Yeah. So then the show goes forward. And meanwhile, he also does another rehearsal with another guy who has to has a dispute about his father's will with his brother. So yeah. there's yeah. other rehearsals happening in the background. And then we also have an episode where we see the acting school that Nathan has set up to train actors to be in the rehearsal. I believe it's episode three where yeah. Nathan leaves Oregon and goes back to L.A., and he set up his own acting school. And yeah. this, to, for me, this is my favorite episode. It's really interesting because you get to see now actors rehearsing to be... Rehearsal actors. Re rehearsing to be actors who do rehearsing. Yeah. <laughs> who yeah. are like in the fielder method, which is all about rehearsing in like... But they have to meet someone yes. and then get to know them and then imitate them. And Nathan has this arc where he's wondering if he's a good teacher or not. So he decides as a way of like a method of self-examination, he'll do his own method. He rehearses being one of the students in his own class. So it, there is an um, amazing moment <laughs> where we go from the real classroom, which has um, 10 or 12 real students. There's just a really amazing moment when they cut to Nathan's rehearsal of his acting school where he has other actors now playing the roles <laughs> of the acting students yeah. <laughs> with himself now in the role of one of the yeah. one of the another actors. actor playing Nathan this is all by this is all <laughs> this is all the way for Nathan to figure out basically to try to um, have an empathetic point of view on the experience that these actors are having mm -hmm. in his own school so he can decide if he's a good teacher or not and mm -hmm. it's, it's really funny and of course it's just the sight gag of watching the actors be now imi being imitated by someone else and seeing Nathan do that too. He puts on a jean jacket and a funny wig and now yeah. he's, he's playing one of the young, hip, um, cool guys. I think his name's Thomas. Thomas, yeah. Thomas. And uh, he's trying to imagine the, the, the uh, acting school from Thomas's point of view. And he's realizing things, or at least he's pretending to realize things for the sake of the audience like oh nathan is like actually not a very good teacher <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's very um bland and that's yeah. not the most engaging way to teach what he realizes from thomas's point of view is that thomas is an actor and he very much likes being on camera so when they're filming <laughs> this they show thomas like nathan as thomas looking at the camera and being like oh actually i quite like being on camera <laughs> and they show his experience leaving the set uh, and being asked to, to sign a waiver. And there's this, it's a very funny moment where it's a very self-reflexive where Nathan is like, he looks at the, his own waiver, the waiver he makes people sign. Yeah. And they just in the show and he's like, wow, this is really long. It would take me hours to read all of this. Like, I don't understand any of these legal terms. And he looks around and it's like, well, everyone else is signing it, so it must be fine. And then he goes ahead yeah. and signs yeah. it. And so there's really, it's a really wonderful moment where um, he's pulling back again the curtain on his own production. The uh, this show has got has gotten generally very good reviews. Mm -hmm. There are a few a few people don't like it, and some some like grumblings about yeah, is it ethical doing what he's doing? And I feel like one of the reasons people watching the show would think that this is somehow more unethical than I don't know any other Hollywood production is only because the show itself. Points that arrow reveal that reveals yeah. how its mechanisms work. Yeah. So if they're if someone's able to critique the show for being unethical, it's like it's only because the show's being honest. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So as the show goes on, he all he importantly is playing the father in this rehearsal, and Adam is aging, aging <laughs> being right? played by different actors, and a couple of really bizarre and brilliant things happen. Um, one of them is that Nathan goes away to do another rehearsal and he's gone for a few weeks. And when he comes back, Adam is now gone from a child to a teenager in his he's, absence. He's been gone the equivalent of 12 years. <laughs> right, right. So the kid is like he's playing Adam is really he's like he, he talks to him. and He's like, I really want you to act the way that you would if your father was gone for 12 years and then just suddenly came back. And so the kid playing Adam really gets into it and he's really mad and he hates his father, And right? he, he develops a drug problem. Yeah. But he's, the kid is learning, <laughs> he's, learn, he, he's learning himself how to 
play a troubled youth. Oh, right. By hanging out with one. By hanging out with one of his friends who has a very similar problem with a, a dad who was gone because he was in jail. Yeah. And apparently is like has sort of a substance abuse problem. Right. And so he's like, <laughs> he's using that in his own performance. Yeah. And to me, this is the most poignant. This is the this is all episode three. It's still episode three. This is the most poignant part of the entire series for me. Yeah, I mean, I'll describe what happens, yeah. which is that the actor playing Adam like becomes more and more um, troubled. Troubled. No, the well, Adam becomes more troubled. The actor becomes more and more, um, I guess, empathetic to how someone in this situation would really behave. Melodramatic. Yeah, melodramatic, but also like hanging out with his real friend and and also. Um, Nathan's pushing him to be more and more like he's talking to him kind of behind the scenes and being like, like, really go for it, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so he ends up, um, there's a scene where Adam overdoses on some kind of drug and Nathan finds him and he's like screaming and crying, Nathan, like, what's happening? Yeah, and and it's, The kid and seems to be dead and Angela, the mom, comes into the room and she's just like horrified and then meanwhile... We know that Angela in real life has had substance abuse issues, so that's kind of another layer to that. Yeah. Then the an ambulance comes to take Adam, and when we see the the paramedics, one of them, they're it's actors Tom from his school, including one Thomas. Thomas so that was a really great touch. Just amazing. And um, and then he's, Adam runs off. And then as they're loading Adam into the ambulance, he suddenly pops up off the stretcher and runs off. And then there's a scene like Nathan's wandering around all night looking for him. And then in the morning he finds him and Nathan is hanging out with a bunch of other miscreants on a play structure in a park. And he and, you know, Nathan, their eyes meet across the park. And then Adam gets into the slide and slides down it and at the bottom pops the younger version a of seven Adam. year olds so or a six year olds this and is they're going back they're going to go back and start over for the with, next episode there i think it's the next episode they're going to start over yeah with with um nathan now present yes as for adam for those years that he he had missed but then another like a brilliant touch at the end of that episode you see the six-year-old and like run over to nathan happily and they walk away hand in hand and then you see the older actor playing Adam pop back out the top of the slide. Like he had just, he just got in at the top and didn't mm. slide down. Yeah. Of course, that was how they got the shot. Yeah. And then he's like, are we done? Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's yeah. like a really brilliant it's a last really, line of the episode. Th that final sequence of, the, of that episode is extremely poignant for a lot of ways. First of all, the mixing of, of reality and, and fakery. Um, we know when we're watching it, all of those things that happened, Adam overdosing. Yeah. Nathan yelling, oh my God, oh my God, I don't know what's happening. And he's actually acting like Nathan never yeah, acts. He yeah. never acts uh, outrageous. Yeah. But he is there. Yeah. And because he's always so deadpan, but there yeah. he's screaming. And then Angela's there, who's not an actress. Yeah. She's just, she is so embroiled in the scene. They show her and she's crying and like, she's, but she's not an actress. Yeah. And you're watching it and you know all of this is fake. Yeah, and that Nathan told the actor to do it. Like he's yes. not letting him improvise the way he's supposed to. You know that all of this is fake. However, you're watching it and still moved by it. That's right. There's the music, which is always, this is the music behind it, which is always so emotionally impactful. Right. What is it saying? Like watching it, it was like the most moved I felt in the whole series. But you're watching something you know that they're faking. Yeah. But then you think, well, all art is just people faking stuff for the less it's, you know unless it's documentary it's always uh, fictional yeah and so but uh, that moves me to watch it yes. and it makes you just kind of reflect for a moment like on what humans are like and like how what we respond to and how actually we have these incredible we have these incredible empathetic possibilities like where we where seeing somebody in pain will make you feel there you will see, feel that along that's with right. them yeah and that's just i guess it just is a moment where you think wow we really are strange like yeah. or, or that's something really kind of nice about humans is that we actually feel each other's feelings mm -hmm. and we'll do it even we'll respond to it even when we know it's fake right so you can just give the appearance of feelings and we will still it will work on like us. our mirror neurons will fire 
it will work on yeah. us. And yeah. so that's a really amazing moment for many, many reasons. And then there's also another poignancy there. I think if you are, especially a parent, and I, I read a, a review of, of um, that scene in particular, a review where they wrote about that scene in particular and mentioned just as a parent, it really tugs your heartstrings. Like the way that, like the rehearsal yeah. presents the possibility of I messed up. Nathan's messed up. Yeah. He's going to go back in time and try yeah. it again. And how that is like a parent's uh, absolute fantasy yeah. about mistakes they may make totally as parents. And so totally. it's an extremely poignant yeah. scene. And um, um, I think it's like the uh, the peak achievement of the series. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. That's a really beautiful scene. And, and you're right. It's working on all those levels at once. Yeah. And again, like breaking the fourth wall with that last um adam coming out the top of the slide again as the actor now but like this this show's always breaking the fourth wall and then it's like there's another fourth there's wall, another wall behind and another it. wall and another yeah. wall and yeah. uh and ultimately like we don't know where the walls end yeah so in the last couple of episodes um and i mean there's been lots of other quirky hilarious awesome brilliant stuff happening in the meantime yeah but too many details, yeah. too many tricks, too many surprises. Just and we don't, wouldn't about, want to yeah. ruin them all. Yeah, either. yeah, yeah. There's a whole sequence about um, at um, Nathan's parents coming to visit and they notice like Angela's very committed to Christianity, raising Adam yes. Christian and Nathan's Jewish and his parents are like, shouldn't you get to raise him Jewish as well. Yes, yeah, so if you're taking this seriously, yeah, yeah. wouldn't you want to raise your kid Jewish? Right, and then that leads to all sorts of conflict that like, we don't have to go into in great detail. No, but, but Nathan is here purposefully putting a, drawing a line in the sand, and you can tell he's purposefully provoking. In retrospect, he's, conflict, he's yeah. provoking conflict for the sake of... But here's the thing. You might say that, okay, so he, is he being like... He's, he's purposely provoking conflict with Angela, who's a like, born-again Christian. Yeah. Very... But at the same time, it's like it's kind of fair that he does do this um, because Angela's response suggests like kind of anti-Semitic feelings. Oh, yeah. So, Big time. so if you're like, well, not Nath- just feeling she says anti-Semitic. She things. says anti-Semitic things like how yeah. she wouldn't want her kid to be even raised around Jew- with like with Jewish ideas as equal to Christian ones right. or whatever. She says something along those lines. And so it. It does seem like pretty anti-Semitic. And so if you're like watching a show going, well, he's like purposely provoking and confronting Angela for the sake of the show. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, but it's on a like a fair point. Quite yeah, frankly. yeah, it is a fair point. And then he, when he brings in that Hebrew teacher to tutor the kid and then he's like, you start to think of her as the voice of reason. And then she ends up also having quite fanatical beliefs <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> about Zionism. Oh, yeah. She's yeah, like yeah. an extreme Zionist and yeah. she's kind of scary too. You're like, yeah. well, <laughs> there's yeah, like yeah. no good guys here. Yeah, everyone's got their blind spots and their like almost, yeah, their ideology that's driving them that they can't see around. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, so then like the really kind of pivotal, important thing that happens towards the end of the show is that one of the child actors who played um adam as a six-year-old becomes the actor himself becomes very emotionally attached to nathan and refuses to stop calling him daddy and like wants to see him again and says he loves him he was too young doesn't understand He he doesn't have a father in real life yeah and he basically imprints on nathan and he doesn't understand that he was acting he doesn't understand the mm-hmm. distinction between the day that he spent being like or the couple of days that he spent being um nathan's son and you see some footage from those days and they, it did look like a lot of fun yeah and um and then he can't really let go of that he doesn't understand that it was fictional and that it was a game of sorts yeah he doesn't understand he doesn't want to understand yeah. he doesn't want it to be the case and so then we see nathan trying to figure out what went wrong by having multiple rehearsals where he reenacts what went on between him and that child actor trying to figure out what he could have done differently to prevent that emotional attachment from happening and um, he spends time with the mother and the child trying to kind of explain help him understand like we're friends but i'm not your father right and he gets so what he yeah his process of course he uses his process again is to get He's going to himself embody, trying to understand what it is to be a parent and what you're supposed to do as a parent. He decides he's going to play the role of the mother. 
and he gets one of the other child actors, a little older one, who's actually, they show him to be a very good actor. Yes. They get him to play the other little boy. Yeah. And they are uh, like mother and son together. Yes. And there's a, and that's really how the series ends with like a... A scene between them. A scene, a few scenes between them, but yeah. one in particular where Nathan is trying to reason out. He get, delivers a monologue that he's clearly prepared, mm -hmm. but that would be from the point of view of, of the mother. To the child. To yeah. the child. And he's saying, you know, sometimes it's good for life to have surprises. Yeah. Even when we get hurt, we like grow and learn from Maybe it. Maybe it was a mistake for me to let you do this. Yeah. Maybe Nathan, the, the man, Nathan, speaking in this third yeah. person now, maybe he doesn't really know what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't know how he was affecting you. Yeah, and which like seems this is enough. a very confusing experience for a, a child, and yeah. I shouldn't have made you do it. And I mean, it's interesting because this part of the show, I mean, you talked about that scene that's like very affecting with the older Adam turning back into the younger Adam. And I think that this last scene was also not just the scene, but the whole sequence yeah. with the young child becoming attached to him is incredibly heart wrenching, partly because we're it's presented as real right. in the show and um and you just feel so you just feel so bad for this kid it's just so heart-wrenching um mm -hmm. that he is he wants a father so badly and he's so attached to nathan even though we're reassured kind of as an audience that he's okay at the end like you're still left thinking and i think you're supposed to be left thinking you know is it really okay for children this young to be, on, to TV. be on, on TV and I mean it's funny what you said before about the only reason that we see that people accuse this show of being unethical is because it's honest yeah. I mean there's child actors we're always watching shows with there's child actors tons of kids TV, on TV shows yeah um, movies and and I mean sh we we've all read memoirs and we know that and read stories like we know that child actors are often traumatized by their experiences yeah. um, and carry that into adulthood and it is very confusing and exploitative but like somehow we're willing to sort of shrug our shoulders and watch anyway and not feel that bad except when the show is actually saying look look what happened look what we're doing here yeah um and so i mean he's really shining a light on something that's happening all around us all the time it is and this that that scene that interaction with the the, the problem with child actor in the last episode has been the source of, a, of some people saying oh I don't know how I feel about this but it's like do you ever watch any other children well on you're TV? not supposed to feel good about it that's the point yeah yeah you're not supposed to feel good about yeah. it yeah so I was very happy to have watched the rehearsal it was a real delight and I've heard there's a second season coming mm -hmm. because it has been it has been a hit so do you have any like closing thoughts on the show um, I think the show is ingenious like I yeah even though i mean yeah it made me uncomfortable in the first episode it made me uncomfortable i think the fact that i felt so uncomfortable watching that first episode speaks to how well it was doing what it was trying to do and um all the times that one feels uncomfortable in that show you should feel uncomfortable that's what the show is for um yeah. it's both it's funny and it's like ingeniously structured and it's also yeah it's also shining a light on some real ethical quandaries or even just unethical practices that we we'd prefer not to look at too closely right yeah. and um about how television shows are made and watched and how we just all shrug our shoulders and yeah and um and not to mention also like the really interesting questions about how human empathy works and like how storytelling works and how much you need to be able to suspend your disbelief and like what's involved in being able to do that yeah. for a story to have the emotional impact that you wanted to have to consider it to be good storytelling so i think it's a great show i think it's really good and i can't wait to see the next season i guess that's it for this episode then naomi thanks for watching and chatting about the rehearsal with me thank you and and spoiler alert this isn't really Aaron. This is an actor playing Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all a rehearsal for the real sweater weather. Oh, no. It's true, though, isn't it? Like, as, uh, <laughs> when we're here talking with each other, I mean, it's us, but it's not us. Mm -hmm. And you're going to edit it? Oh, yes. Yeah. All of the, the nudity, the crass jokes, the uh, stuffed animals that we play with. Yeah. Um, the fights that we have the I don't know the honking of horns in the back and uh, on the street outside yeah yeah well Aaron 
Well, Naomi? It's all an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> if you are, Aaron, which Folks, I doubt. we're an illusion, but so are you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.